Um, I am thrilled to have you all here tonight to celebrate the launch of How Can I Help You? So this novel is very close to home, as you will come to find out. But before we go into all the fun stuff, I do have some housekeeping rules. <laughs> Not rules, details, I should say. Um, so first of all, um, we have more chairs back here, not too many left, but we have some chairs back here, or if you need to get a chair, you can grab one that's, you know, not being used and bring it on over, or you can stand um, as you wish. Um, there are bathrooms downstairs, public bathrooms downstairs, and uh, so you can get there by the elevator here, or the stairs, which you probably came up on. Uh, there's, like I said, there's drinks available back there, and cookies, thank you very much, Laura, and the publisher. Um, and uh, there's a recycle bin over there. If you do have any drinks, please throw those, dispose there. Um, and there will be, um, so there will be books on sale at the end. So thank you very much to Words for being here and providing books. So we have books for both of us. And um, I also want to say thank you to Victor's Flowers for providing this beautiful flower arrangement from the staff for Laura. Oh. All right, and if time allows, we will have Q&A, but that is up to our authors. Okay, and my name is Jill Faraday. I'm the director of South Orange Public Library. I'm so excited to see you all here. Uh, so you're in for a real treat this evening. Uh, South Orange Public Library is honored to kick off the success of the novel, How Can I Help You? Um, it has received two starred reviews and endless accolades, such as, uh, one of the Library Journal's Best uh, Mysteries of the Year. <laughs> One of Crime Read's Best Psychological Thrillers in July. Uh, a Library Read's Top 10 Pick for July. An Amazon Editor's Pick for Best Books of July. And a Strand Bookstore Pick of the Month as well. Now, the review, a review in Self Awareness said, How Can I Help You is smartly scary entertainment that will have readers guessing about its outcome until almost the final page. It's canny and chilling. Kirkus Reviews said, Watching these two women peer at each other as they terrorize the bookshelves is great fun. And it is. Tonight, we are also honored to have we are honored to have the two fabulous authors who will unveil the inspiration of the serial killer protagonist, its library setting, and the very dark plot. But first, uh, before we get to that book, John Michaud is the collection manager, uh, I'm the collection management librarian at Milburn Free Public Library. His new nonfiction book, Last Call at Coogan's, was named a must-read book of June by the Chicago Review and a must-read book of Summer by Lit Hub. The New York Times called it an ambitious overview of the forces that batter the individual as they do the collective gentrification, homogeny, and displacement. Michaud's debut novel, When Tito Loved Clara, was named Best Book of the Year by the Barnes & Noble Review and was a finalist for the Writer Center First Novel um, Prize. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Washington Post, Tin House, Lit Hub, Crime Reads, and numerous other publications. The recipient of a 2022 fellowship from the New Jersey Council of the, Art, of the Arts, Michelle lives in Maplewood with his wife and two sons. <laughs> Laura Sims and her family live in South Orange. <laughs> part-time as a reference librarian here oh. at the South Orange Public Library. And she, and she hosts a program called Special Conversations. It's every other week. Uh, she is also an award-winning poet. I bet you didn't know what's <laughs> uh, Who has published four poetry collections. Her essays and poems have appeared in the New, New Republic, Boston Review, Conjunctions, Electric Lit, Gulf Coast and more. Sims is also the author of the critically acclaimed novel Looker, which is also on sale. Uh, and now in development, Looker is now in development for television with E1 and Emily Mortimer's King Bee Productions. Her second novel, How Can I Help You, which she'll be reading from tonight, has been named a must read for summer in Town and Country Parade, the Star Tribune, Craig, 
primaries in New Jersey Monthly, and many more. In a star review, Publishers Weekly called it a brilliant slice of psychological suspense. And in another star review, the Library Journal said it was a psychological thriller that stands out in a very crowded field. So please join me in giving Laura and Don a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, thank everyone for being here. This is so amazing to actually be here launching the book after, you know, books take a long time and they have a long road. So to actually be here with all of you is amazing. I just have a few words of thanks that I need to say. Um, I'll try to be brief, but it, there's a lot. So just hang in there. Um, I want to thank Jill Faherty first. Um, there she is. Yes, so she has been she's our director here. And she has been so supportive and enthusiastic about this book and this event, and I can't thank her enough um, for that support. Erica Dragonetti, she is here somewhere, yes. And Erica has been essential in planning and publicizing this event also. Um, Keisha Miller and Nancy Janow, also, also amazing publicists. Um, <laughs> that's their side job. And Brent Shelley, is Brent still here? Anyway, yes, oh yes. And Brent, Brent has made everything look nice and helped me arrange everything. One day he literally walked around this floor with me as I tried out different chairs and stools to see which ones I liked best. So, you know, above and beyond, that's what you get here at South Orange Library, as you know. Lindita Canny is here, my wonderful supervisor. She is amazing. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the staff in general here. I absolutely love working here. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> and I have to. I actually really, really, it is a joyful place for me to be, and that's because the staff and the patrons are, are wonderful. So thank you all so much. Um, it's amazing to see so many friends and familiar faces from all different walks of our lives, including even our accountant is here tonight, we <laughs> Linda Katz. Um, but no, seriously, we moved from Brooklyn about five years ago to Soma, and I think if Soma weren't such an incredible community, we might have had some regrets, but we have had absolutely none. So I wish I could go through and thank all of you, but of course I can't, but thank you to my mom friends, my youth sports mom and dad friends, my writer friends, everybody, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have a few of my first readers here in the audience. My husband, Corey Mead, who some of you may know. He is always supportive and he always helps me laugh through the hard times, which is an amazing attribute. I thank him so much. And Margaret Lewis, my best friend, is here. She flew from Seattle this morning at 6 a.m. to be here. And she lives across the country, but she is with me on every journey, every step of the way. Do not cry. Um, <laughs> and um, Kim Casno, who I met at the school bus stop, thank God, five years ago. She has just been a light in my life here for so long, and she also life coaches me sometimes when I need it, and if you need a life coach, she is amazing. So, um, Marsha Lebeau, dear friend who runs The Right Space. I wrote a lot of this novel at The Right Space in Orange, and if you are a writer and you're looking for an oasis and a place to have peaceful writing time, you need to go go to the right space. Marsha's right there, you can talk to her. We, okay, good. Um, Caleb, my videographer and son. <laughs> he has helped me make some really fun reels for this book and he does not do it out of love. I pay him <laughs> For every reel, and he's getting paid tonight also. <laughs> to, 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 
pictures and videos, so I know there's love in there, but he's, you know. Um, and a very special shout out to Chris Clemens, my agent, who's sitting right there on the end. He is, I think of him as the man who makes everything happen, because it's true. Without him, nothing happens. He is a brilliant reader. He is a fierce champion of my work. Um, I couldn't ask for a better, better agent or friend. So thank you, Chris. And John Michaud, thank you for doing this. Right in the middle of your own book promotion. We, when we moved here, Chris, I'm Chris, John and his wife Sarita were two of the first people we met. And so we knew when we met them that, oh, this is a good place. This is a good place because they're so cool. And John is right in the middle of promoting his newest book, nonfiction book, Last Call at Coogan's, which is on sale here tonight. Uh, it's an amazing book about a bar on, in Washington Heights that was like a major community center, um, struggled with gentrification and COVID and ultimately closed. It's a beautiful story and it's about many things, but it's one of those wonderful nonfiction books that entertains as much as it informs and I think you should buy it tonight. <laughs> they have it, the so words is selling it. So, okay. So I'm done with my thank yous. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how can I help you before I read. Um, so it is about two local librarians, local library workers, I should say, Margot and Patricia. And it's told in their alternating viewpoints. Um, Margot is a former nurse who has left a, a trail of suspicious patient deaths in her wake. <laughs> and she has now come to this small town library um, and is living this peaceful life. She's been living peacefully, quelling her urges for a couple of years. And then Patricia shows up. And she's the new reference librarian. And she is also kind of running from the past, not quite so dark of a past. But she had a major literary rejection, and she has just, she's a writer. And she's decided that she's done with writing, and she's just going to focus on being a librarian now. But as soon as the two meet, they are drawn to each other inexplicably for different reasons, and that is where the trouble begins. So I'm going to read um, close to the beginning a uh, place here. This is Margot's perspective, and um, it's right after, soon after Patricia has started working. So Margot has started to feel unsettled by Patricia's presence. While I'm checking out a pile of comic books for two teens, I glance Patricia's way. Stylish and sleek, she's like a rare bird over there, flaunting her feathers in the gloom. She radiates coolness, too. I look around, trying to see the library through her eyes. The water stains on the ceiling, the faded gray love seat in YA, the drawn faces of our computer users wash deadly white or gray in the light of their screens. Will she stay in a place like this, or just land here for a while before flitting away? I turn my full attention back to the teens. These ones aren't so bad. They're nervous and shy, with acne-pitted skin and mouths full of metal. You kids have any schoolwork to do, or are these comic books your homework, I ask, and they titter. They're manga, the boy says, but not unkindly, not haughtily. I know what manga are. After two years, I've learned, but I play along anyway. While we're chatting, I sense Patricia's eyes on me, her interest warming my skin. What brought you here, Margo? She's wondering. But when I look up, she's picking through the desk drawers, examining a ruler, not the least bit interested in learning my story, of course. Who am I to her? My spirits sag a little as I say goodbye to the teens. Just behind them is Julia Mather, one of our top five local eccentrics. It's like she popped up out of nowhere with her long, flyaway gray hair, her gnarled hands, and glossy red nails. It's hard not to stare at those nails as she gestures wildly. She's clearly worked up. I've returned several books in that metal box outside, 
and you all continue to lose them. I wait for a beat. She'll go on. Julia always goes on. I returned one just the other day, and now it's listed as lost. And apparently I owe money. My taxes pay your salaries here, you know. We do know. Julia has told us many times. Other patrons have too. If the book is lost, I start. But it isn't. I returned it to the metal box, Julia insists. My fingers tap quickly across the keyboard to bring up her record. Ah, I say. With one hand, with one set of red nails, she twitches a long strand of hair over her shoulder. I stare at the screen, pretending to be lost in thought. Usually, Julia amuses me. Today, though, she simply annoys me. I try to breathe and relax my face. I had patients like her, of course, domineering ones who were always right, no matter what the nurses and doctors said or did. But patients were easier to deal with half-naked and vulnerable in their hospital gowns, shivering with illness or fear, even as they struggled for power. You knew they wanted comfort, reassurance, more than anything, and it was easy to provide. I never raised my voice once, like some others did. I only smiled and soothed them with words or a quick jab. A shame I can't do that with Julia. <laughs> I stare at her coldly, scanning her body. When she was younger, she must have been beautifully slim. Now she's the kind of thin that makes your skin hurt to look at her. Her nails are hidden under glossy color, but I bet they're ridged and bumpy, signs of ill health. And her dry, rasping cough doesn't bode well either, but who knows? People like her can live off bitterness for years, <laughs> unless someone helps them, nudges them over the rim. What is it, what does it say? Julia leans forward, breaking the spell as she cranes her neck toward my screen. I refuse to turn it toward her, though I'm supposed to. I see one book here that is long overdue, The Rise of Towson Manor by J.S. Cullen. She nods vigorously. That's the one. Go out there and check. Go out there right now and you'll see. It's there. In my mind, I'm lifting her up in the air, rattling her bones, <laughs> dropping her back down. That isn't my job, Mrs. Mather. Other staff members do that regularly. If it were in the box, they would have found it by now, and we'd see it here in the system. I tap my screen. Julia rears up, lifting her hands with her voice. This is the 44th book of mine you've lost. I won't pay this library a cent. I pay your salary, you know, and everyone's salary here. She rakes her nails through the air to include us all, the layabouts who profit from Julia's bounteous wealth. <laughs> Patricia is watching. Everyone is watching. I have the urge to bark out an angry laugh, but I beat it back. I'm afraid this is the 44th book of ours that you've lost, Mrs. Mather, I say quietly, leaning close and staring into her roomy blue eyes. Just as her quivering lips open to protest, I lean even closer. Now go home and find that book. Go home and find the other books, too. If you don't, you'll be paying a hefty fine, one that's long overdue. I'll collect it myself. <laughs> Julia takes two stumbling steps back. I think she'll make a fuss, but then her hands wilt at her sides. She steps farther back from the desk, staring at me. Then she turns suddenly and shuttles through the door, her curtain of gray hair flying behind her. So, Laura, thank you for that. And um, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to add my congratulations to those you've already received thank today. Thank you, John. I've been, uh, you know, along with you on this journey uh, yes. from the beginning, and so I've seen how how hard it has been, yes. and um, it's wonderful to be here to celebrate this triumph. So Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, I thought we could begin by um, talking about the elephant in the room, or the elephant that is the room. Uh, you're a librarian, I'm a librarian, we're here at the library, there are other librarians in the room. Raise your hand. Um, so what, what uh, inspired you to set this novel in a library, and what, what um, 
what aspects of your work as a librarian inform the, the writing? Yes, definitely. I mean, I said it here because I work here, and you know, I, I started working here in 2018, but I was working pretty infrequently. It wasn't until 2020 and the pandemic hit, and some people were not comfortable coming back to work that I started working more often, and because I was ready to get out of the house and <laughs> get back to doing something. And so, um, it was interesting because it allowed me to really immerse myself in this fascinating place where, you know, you see all a full range of human behavior, um, characteristics, everything. It's 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 wonderful, and so it was really inspiring to me. And I started taking notes, little notes. I just jot notes every now and then, and I was thinking, oh, I want to write something about the public library and I thought even like nonfiction at first I didn't know um, but so that was that was the choice for the setting ultimately when I put this together with Margo who I'll talk about later um, it had to be in the library and definitely my work at the reference desk has influenced the book some of the you know interactions that I have with patrons they're not represented literally here, <laughs> but they are inspiration for it, definitely. I also really wanted to write a book that showed the library as it truly is. Um, I mean, a novel as close to that as close to that as possible when you're writing fiction. But I, I know we have lots of depictions of the library that are super romanticized and pretty outdated, like that you see in film and in literature of the library as this sacred, silent book vault. And I, I did it with the librarian, you know, with her reading glasses, shushing people, which Margo does a little bit, but um, I wanted to kind of blow that up and, and show like what the library is really like today. And it, it is not like that today. It is a community center. It is a place that welcomes everyone. Um, a lot of times it is welcoming people who have been left behind by many other institutions. Um, and so I wanted to, to put that in the book. So um, having chosen your setting, then you, you needed to create a story. <laughs> and um, why don't you talk a little bit more about these two characters who, who kind of um, propel the story forward? Yes. Oh, I love your pronunciation. Um, yes, yeah, so it was, I had listened to an episode of Criminal, it's a true crime podcast, years ago about Jane Toppin, who, and they called her Jolly Jane. She was a nurse from the 1800s, and she was super cheerful and efficient. She was a very good nurse, and she was also injecting her patients with morphine and atropine and killing them. <laughs> And uh, she was a serial killer in the 1800s. And I found her so fascinating from this episode that I kind of put her in the back of my mind. Because I, I always had wanted to write about a female serial killer. Because I find them really fascinating. They're kind of rare creatures. And she is especially fascinating for many reasons. Um, and one of them is the dissonance between her, you know, personality and the terrible things she was doing. But, um, so I kind of had her in the back of my mind, and then I had the library in mind, and I don't remember when or why, but at some point I smushed them together. I was like, oh, she has to be at the library. I'll bring her into 21st century, and she's like in hiding at this library. And so that was where it started, and then it felt a little bit um, closed, like a clo too much of a closed system with just her in it. And so I f started thinking, okay, she needs a foil, right? And there, and then Patricia, and I, again, I don't remember, my memory's terrible, but I don't remember like when I came up with her, but she is a writer. Like I put a lot of myself into Patricia. Um, she's a frustrated writer. Any writer 
can identify with a frustrated writer because you have so many rejections and failures and everything. Um, so I was able to create her pretty easily. Um, and I will say that by the end of the writing process, she became the more interesting of the two to me uh, because she kind of undergoes an evolution that we can't talk about much. <laughs> Rereading the book in preparation for this conversation, one of the things that struck me most was that both of these women are very lonely. And I, I wondered if you could talk about loneliness as a theme and as a potential source for the drama in the book. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. They are both lonely. I mean, if you think about these two roles, serial, being a serial killer is kind of a lonely... <laughs> Lonely existence, and so is being a writer. I find a lot of overlap actually between serial killers and writers that I'm trying to write an essay about. Um, but the, it is lonely. Um, there is a loneliness to both of them, and I think they both, like you saw in that that part I just read, where Margot is like thinking that Patricia is watching her and is kind of tuned into that. You know, she wants to be seen. She wants to be seen, and so does Patricia. Um, and I think they kind of do that for each other in this weird way. They, they see each other, for better or worse. Um, and we all want to be seen, right? We all want have that craving for connection. Um, and they both have this craving for connection. Margot finds connection when she kills people. This is one of her ways of connecting with humanity, because she's probably a psychopath. So, and Patricia, I think, also turns to writing for that connection, um, but that has been stifled, and Margot's um, connecting activity has been stifled as well. So they are seeking other channels, and I think they look to each other for that, oddly. Yeah, um, and along similar lines, you know, I wanted to hone in on the the, the, uh, the word help in the, in the title of the book. Um, and I wanted you to talk similarly about this idea of helping and how women are expected to be helpful and librarians are expected to be helpful. And how does that play out in the book and how that important the book? Yeah. Um, I think it's so interesting that, I mean, Margot is helpful. She is helpful. She is a doer. She says this about herself. She's like, I'm a doer. She kind of separates herself from her colleague Liz, who is a big reader. And at some point she says, readers aren't doers. And Patricia is kind of the same. She's a reader. She's a writer. So there is this, like, um, tension between them where Margo's a doer, she helps people. Patricia has a complicated relationship to helping. She kind of is torn between this idea of wanting to be a public servant, wanting to be a librarian, and her writing ambitions, which you know are not helpful. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of interplay between those. Um, it's true, you know, women have been assigned to the caretaker role for millennia. And one of the reasons that Margot interests me so much in the real Jane Toppin and other women who kill inside of caretaking roles, which is how women usually kill when they do, um, is that it's, and this is problematic, but is that it is sort of a feminist act. Um, it may not be conscious, right? But it seems to me like a transgressive act of fighting against, okay, you've consigned me to this role as a nurse or taking care of parents or children, but I am going to push back and turn this role inside out. And again, I'm not saying that's a conscious, a conscious thing, but it's interesting to me because of that. Um, yeah, and, and Patricia, in a, in a much more low-key way, rejects the expectations of this relationship she has with her boyfriend of, of remaining with him, and she uh, kind of goes out on her own and does her own thing. Yeah. So in that way, she also is subverting she so is, yes. the societal expectations. Yeah, yeah, totally. Though not in a violent way. Not a violent way. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, you know, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing you when you uh, published Looker uh, a number of years ago. And one of, the, one of the things you said at that time that's always stuck with me is that you like to keep the crazy on the page. <laughs> and, 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 um, you, you know, both Looker and this novel deal with some rather extreme characters. And you don't, you have never struck me as an extreme character. I don't present. What did a friend of mine, I think Marcia said, I present normal. <laughs> normal, yeah. So can you talk about navigating that and, and managing that separation between yeah. the crazy on the page and the not crazy in real life? Yeah, I mean, I, f I think it's the only way to be, really. You know, there is that famous Flaubert saying that I'm going to botch, but something like live like a bourgeois so you can write violently, something like that. And maybe that doesn't work for everybody, but that works for me. I have to have a very orderly, sane life. Um, and that gives me the freedom and the stability to then go crazy on the page. But without, like I cannot have a chaotic life. It just does not work for me. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I compartmentalize, like serial killers do. <laughs> um, well, and what would you say draws draws you to these characters, like the narrator and Booker and, and these two women yeah. in this book? Yeah. Um, what, what's the appeal of these extreme, extreme characters? I, you know, am fascinated by humans in general. And I think looking at extreme examples of human behavior and human nature can really tell us a lot about humanity in general. I think that we have a tendency to put very uh, definitive dividers between us. We're the good people, right? We don't do bad things. And those people who do terrible things, who are crazy or whatever you want to say. And I don't really believe in the existence of those dividers. And I like to look at people who step over societal lines and, and cross into kind of dark behavior. I like to show people who you might relate to. Um, but because of a set of circumstances or personality, whatever, um, kind of step across those lines and, and uh, do terrible things. I think it's possible for any of us to do terrible things. I have a very dark view of human nature, but, you know. It's also more exciting to write about those characters. It sure is. It's, yes. Yeah. And it's fun to, again, if you're separating the crazy, like, it's, it's fun to be, inhabit those people and then pull back and, you know, take my son to his baseball game. <laughs> um, I wonder if I could ask you a couple of more writerly questions. Sure. Um, you've had a really interesting career trajectory. You started out as a poet and you published four well-received books of poetry. Can you talk about what prompted you to move from poetry to writing fiction and how that process has gone for you? Sure, yeah. I, you know, when I was really little, I wrote both poetry and fiction, and I didn't really distinguish between the two of them. Um, but then in high school, I had, you know, a couple English teachers who loved my poems, and so I just kind of latched on to, oh, I'm a poet. I'm a poet, and and I loved writing poems, and so I was a poet, and I, I wrote poetry for many years, published books, and at a certain point, and I don't know why, um, I just wanted a different challenge at a certain time in my life, um, which is not to say poetry isn't challenging, but for me, I wanted something new, and I also wanted something that would take longer to do, and like, you know, be a long project versus something that you write in a few minutes of inspiration and return to. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, it was kind of a natural evolution for me. And I don't really put a divider between my poetry and, like, I don't feel like I've abandoned poetry. I feel like now I take that creative energy and put it into prose. Well, I, I mean, I would say that, that your prose has the 
precision and specificity and, um, and uh, just accuracy of depiction that, that great poetry does. So I would think that that's, good. that's informing you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Are and you? I care about sound too, like yeah. the sound of the line. Uh, are you still writing poems? Formal poems? Oh. No? Yeah, yeah. So I haven't in quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the book, you refer directly to um, Shirley Jackson, um, to uh, when, when we lived in the castle. We have always lived in the castle, yeah. um, uh, which was clearly an influence on you. Uh, were there other books that you, that you saw as influences or companions as you were working on this? Yeah, more companions. Um, definitely that one, which I happened to read when I, well, I, I, when I had started writing this novel, and I just... You know, I, I reread it. Sorry, I reread it. It was the second time I'd read it, and it just like blew my mind again. And then I, so I loved it so much, I put it in the book. <laughs> um, but a couple of other books that I, one book that I read before I started writing this was Sarah Schmidt's novel, See What I Have Done, which is a really beautiful, beautifully written novel about Lizzie Borden, you know, <laughs> Lizzie Borden took an X. Um, and reading it, I just thought, oh, this is a way of writing about a historical true crime that is beautiful and meaningful and layered, and I want to do something like that. Um, and then a, a, an important companion book was, which I had already finished a draft, I think, of this one, but a friend read it and said, you have to read, have you read Patricia Highsmith's The Blunderer? And I'd read a, a lot of Patricia Highsmith before, but I'd never read The Blunderer. Um, and it's kind of hard to find, but it's a similar setup, um, eerily similar, where there are these two men, one of them has killed his wife and made it look like an accident, and another man wants to kill his wife, so he's kind of like looking at this guy as a, you know, like as a guide and they meet and they have this strange like relationship so that one was important too um, were there any books about libraries that you oh about? yes yes i read the library book by susan orlean which if you have not read yet is fantastic absolutely fantastic and it influenced uh something very big in this book but yeah i i love that book any other novels about libraries that you, that you would like to? No. no. I, don't, I can't think of them. There's not that many, yeah. I know that there aren't, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, your book has been featured in a wide array of periodicals, and including crime reads. So I wonder, both when you were writing it, and, so there's a difference between writing it and publishing, right? There's, there's the whole marketing angle. But how do you see, what genre do you see this book falling in? And, and how do you see that? Did it inform your writing of the book and um, how you're talking about it? Yeah. So just, I'd love to hear how, what, what your thoughts about yeah. genre. I never think of my books as anything, any genre when I'm writing them. I'm just writing a story. But yes, then you get to the marketing piece and there are labels that are put on it. This, I think the publisher has put it as literary fiction slash thriller suspense, right? So, which is good. I mean, I think it's like literary suspense. I don't know, I also like it when people call it literary horror, because I do think that's accurate. Um, it has a lot in common with psychological horror. I mean, genre is, you know, it's a pain. It can be helpful, right? Uh, but it can also be very limiting and put, works in a box, put writers in a box. Um, I'm happy that it's a crime, called a crime novel. Um, but yeah, it wasn't in my mind like, oh, I'm writing a mystery. It's really not a mystery. There's no mystery about <laughs> There's some mystery. Um, and yeah, I just don't think about it. But it's tightly plotted, and, and, it, yeah. and uh, um, it is very suspenseful. So, yes. Uh, and that it's must just, have been in your mind while you were writing it. I guess so. It's just how I write, and I don't know why. But. <laughs> um, do you want to take some questions from the audience? Yeah, do you want to do a couple questions? How are we? Oh, yeah, a couple questions. Anybody have a question? Yeah, um, I'm interested uh, in the serial killer, um, you know, the mindset.
mindset, I mean, we're all kind of fascinated by this case in Long Island now. And I have been looking at uh, some of the interviews with, you know, people back in 2011 who were psychologists who, you know, talk about we can expect that this person is just an ordinary guy, whether this suspect is or not. It's a mixed bag, but, uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of theories about serial killers. I just read Anne Rules. I listened to Anne Rules. 18-hour book about Ted Bundy. Oh, Stranger okay. Beside Me. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering, did you do research into the mindset? Um, yeah. I mean, I have through the years because I've been fascinated too. So I've read a lot of books. I've For this one, I read a book called Fatal by Harold Schechter, which is about Jane Toppin that was very helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have done lots of informal research <laughs> through the years. Um, <laughs> I read Women Who Kill years ago, which was in the 80s. Um, yeah, I have, I have done it. So I, I feel like I've, I didn't do specific re much specific research while writing this because I don't like to do that when writing fiction. But I've definitely <coughs> got it in me already. Yes, Pamela. Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about that word help yeah. and women's helping roles and help is the title. And I am lucky enough that I've already read the book. And one of the things that I found so creepy and unsettling and effective about Margot is she, she, she talked about um, women who murder as maybe acting in a rebellious way. Yeah. Here, she, Pamela was asking about Margot and how she is convinced of her uh, helpfulness. And it's true, I mean, that is what makes her creepy, is she believes um, her worldview, I guess. And her worldview is she is a helpful person. Um, I don't know, when she is actually committing these murders, I don't know if she, she's not quite an angel of death or angel of mercy, whatever they're called. She's not quite a mercy killer, but she definitely is convinced of her own, uh, the rightness of what she's doing, for sure. So, I, yeah, I don't think she sees it as a rebellious act or a feminist act or anything I, I kind of do. I see it that way, but that's me putting that on. Um, but I, yeah, she is definitely a creature who, I'm really interested too in just thinking about perspective and how perspective, our perspectives, how we all live in these, you know, little fish bowls with our ideas about ourselves and other people. And everything we do is influenced by how we think, what we believe about ourselves and other people, and she's an extreme example. So, um, one of the, one of the things that struck me about the book, just just thinking about that, is that you give very little background information on both of these women, and so it's their actions that reveal their characters, and that's a very powerful part of the book because we're not. Yes. loaded up with, with biographical information about them. I'm so glad you said that, John, because I really hate explaining my characters. <laughs> I did a little bit in this one, like more than I did in Looker, and some readers do not like this, you know, they do not like it. They want people to be explained, and I don't really believe people can be explained, or people's actions can be explained. We've seen too much evidence of that in real life. Um, so I did give little hints of background, but I never, I never tried to fully describe Margot's childhood. Well, this is why she's like this. I just 
I don't buy that. So I do like, sh I like putting characters in the scene and yeah, you see them act and that's who they are. Um, just a comment and an observation about the humor in the book, which I think just gives it um, another level of kind of chill somehow. It, it, um, I remember recently we were talking about The Perfect Nanny, and while that left me feeling just kind of gutted, this somehow has this kind of light touch that, uh, were you aware right. of that um, as you're writing, or is that just you um, <laughs> faced with these, Maybe. you know, with this story? Yeah, definitely wasn't too conscious, although I did have a lot of fun writing this book. Right. So I think that, I mean, to some extent, it's, but I think that comes through, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you said that. That there is, there is, it is kind of funny. It is kind of a funny book, dark, dark, darkly funny. Um, but Looker has that too. So I guess it's just me. <laughs> I like to laugh at the horrors of the world. <laughs> oh yes, right. Uh, All the, the way from Princeton. Yeah, well, it's uh, um, great to be here. Uh, of course, I know you from from Peru. Yeah. Both, you know, teaching students English. Yes. And I know you as a tremendously dedicated teacher. Thank I mean, you. I work with your students, they came in, and, and you know, you really were into that, that uh, profession. I mean, that was, a, yeah. that, was your, that was what you were. Yeah. I was wondering how writing these kinds of novels overlaps with that mm. teacherly self. I mean, part of it was a didactic quality. There. Yes. But what do you, how do you sort of see yourself now as the Oh, that's interesting. I kind of see more that now that I'm working here, that that a lot of that teacherly stuff transfers over. I miss teaching a lot, but there is an overlap, right? That kind of, it's a kind of public service, you know? And, and so I get my public service fix at the library now <laughs> instead of, instead of um, at school. So, yeah, and I do, you know, Looker had some teaching scenes in it, so I, I poured that into into Looker. But yeah, I think it's more that my librarian days have helped me satisfy those old teaching, the old teaching things. So, should we run? Any other questions? One more over here. Yes, hi. I'm curious about your process. Do you know where you're going when you start? Mm -hmm. Or do they say, do those characters surprise you or take you someplace else? Yes, definitely. I do not like to have a plan. I mean, I have an idea in my head or a character and, and a setting. Yeah, and just, I found that trying to be really, I'm a very organized person in my regular life. I have lists and sub lists and subless, my husband can tell you. <laughs> but um, in writing, I found that trying to organize and like write an outline just kills, kills what I'm writing. I know it works for other people, but not for me. So I tend to just let the story and the characters lead me. And that's part of the fun, is to be surprised when a character does or, or says something you don't expect. And uh, then you have to figure it out, like, okay, what's going to go next? So, yes, definitely like a looser, looser process. Well, thank you all so much for coming.